Uh, my name is Charles Miller. Uh, I was supposed to be here to talk about Leopard, but uh, for reasons that I'll talk about in just a second. Instead, I'm going to talk about the iPhone. So uh, if you're here to, and you're dying to learn about Leopard, please read the conference paper I submitted. It's got everything I wanted to say, but uh, uh, I'll explain just shortly why, why I switched topics. Uh, so the talk today... A uh, brief introduction, um, my old talk, which was originally supposed to be an hour long, but then it was going to be a 20-minute turbo talk, and now it's exactly four slides. Uh, then I'm going to talk about Mac security in general and uh, why it's, it's not so good and uh, why breaking into these things is, is relatively easy. And then finally, uh, I'll talk about the iPhone exploit that, that myself and, and two other guys in my work put together and how it works and, and what we had to do to, to, to get it to work. All right, so uh, what happened to, to Leopard? Well, one thing that happened was it got delayed. So it was supposed to come out when I submitted the talk. Uh, it was supposed to come out in May or June. They pushed it back because of the iPhone. So it, it really would have limited what I could say anyway because I've only seen it under NDA. Um, everyone wants me to talk about iPhone anyway. So, uh, and, and like I said, everything that I was going to say about, I, about Leopard is in the conference paper anyway. So you know, just take a look at that. All right, so... Uh, what about Apple and security? Everyone, you know, the, the the prevailing belief is that Apple is more secure than than, than Windows. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but their website certainly thinks so. So they say uh, Mac OS X delivers the highest level of security through adoption of industry standards, open software development, and wise architectural decisions. And then they say that uh, Apple engineers designed Safari to be secure from day one. So they, they're they're very sure of themselves. Uh, so, so, so why, why take the time to even, you know, try this? Well, uh, so far they're still pretty small in the market, six and a half percent, but they're growing. All the cool kids are doing it. So they had the Mac, or, uh, the month of Apple bugs. So they, 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 uh, released a lot of bugs and, and uh, Apple's there. Uh, they had the Hack a Mac contest where someone found a QuickTime bug and, and won a quick 10,000. Uh, and then Safari, which was, you know, so highly touted on the previous slide. When they released it for Windows, they found, researchers found 18 vulnerabilities on the first day. Plus, it's always fun to just shut up the local Mac enthusiast. Okay, so this is the part of the, my old talk that I just couldn't live without telling you guys about. So, uh, one of the things about Macs, as opposed to, to if, you, if you came from a Linux background and you expect uh, Ptrace to actually work, uh, it doesn't. So, on a Mac, you can't read or write registers or memory using Ptrace. You have to use what's called the mock API. And uh, to help myself do research and hopefully others, uh, I ported PyDebug to Mac OS X. Uh, it's not it, you know, 100% done, but it, it's usable. And uh, PyDebug is a pure Python debugging API, which is it, it's natively, it, it was designed to work on, on Win32. And the reason I did that is it allows the, the, the use of the PyMA framework, which is a very powerful reverse engineering framework that um, you should, I all recommend you use. So you can download this, uh, this port that I wrote uh, from the site, the PyMay site. And you can't really see it, but this is a screenshot uh, of the file fuzzer module running for PyMay on a Mac. All right, what, what else did I want to say about, about Leopard? Uh, it's going to have Dtrace, which is, is going to be really cool for, for vulnerability research. So Dtrace is a dynamic tracing mechanism it's built right into the kernel, so Apple had to do a lot of work to get this uh, working in their kernel. Uses the D programming language, which is a, a subset of C, more or less. Um, basically, there's all these probes located throughout the entire kernel, and they can be accessed through uh, things called traces. And uh, what's cool about it is that when the probes aren't active, they don't slow down the system in any noticeable way, so basically they're, they're always available to you. And they're designed basically... This Dtrace is designed basically for system administrators to, to be able to do uh, debugging activities on, on production servers. And uh, check out the manual. But uh, what, what I see it for is a great opportunity for researchers and uh, vulnerability analysts to, uh, to, to write really great tools really easily. So, and I have examples of all of these in, in the conference paper. So you can write a, a file system monitor like FileMon and NetMon and basically like two or three lines of this D programming language. You can re rewrite share fuzz, which is an environment variable fuzzer, uh, in a couple lines. Uh, you can write ltrace, strace, whatever you want. And uh, again, I have examples of this in the, in the conference paper. You can get instruction traces, so you can figure out exactly which test cases you're testing. 
go down which code paths. You get code coverage for free, so uh, unlike Pi May, which requires you to use Ida Pro and uh, use debuggers, this this you'll get basically the piece locking functionality, and it won't be, it won't even slow down because you don't have to worry about the 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 um, breakpointing and, and the, the slowdown. So and lots more. Check out the paper. Okay. So uh, I, I made a claim earlier that Macs are are easy to hack into, and, and now I'm going to try to convince you that's true. And the, the fundamental reason that they're easy to, 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 to uh, attack is that they're easy to use. So, you know, Apple's big, big deal is that uh, Macs, you know, they're very easy and friendly, and they really are. And uh, to enable them to be friendly, they, they have like an absurd number of set your day root programs. So there's at least 50, and uh, a large number of them you'll never have heard of. So those are very suspect that you know, there's, there's basically no documentation on them. They're there, they run, and, you know, they seem to take something on like standard in or out, but I think with a little research, uh, you could probably manage to elevate your privileges to that. And then there's, there's a few old ones that are around that those haven't been, uh, say, at root on a Linux box in like two years, and they still are happily on, on a Mac. Um, Safari is the default web browser for Macs, and, uh, it's very friendly, it's, you know, very easy to use, and, and that's what, what's the problem, so. It uh, has a huge attack surface. So all these programs I listed on here, uh, Safari will spawn those for you if you try to browse to a particular file type that it corresponds to. So if you browse to a page and you, you click on an MP3, it'll launch uh, iTunes, for example. And so the point is, not only do you have Safari to look for bugs in, but you can look in for bugs in all these other programs, too. And if you find a bug in, say, uh, you know, iTunes or, or Help Viewer, there's been one, so you find a bug in one of these obscure programs, it turns out to be the same as a, a client-side Safari exploit. So you've got a lot, of, a lot of places you can look for bugs if, you're, if you want to try to get someone with the client-side. Uh, a great little tool that it has is called Crash Reporter, and it monitors all your programs. So if you're into fuzzing, like I am, uh, one of the first things you have to do is monitor the target that you're fuzzing to make sure that you, you know when it crashes or when there's been a problem. And you don't have to do that on a Mac. It does it for you. So you can just fuzz away. You don't have to worry about it. And Crash Reporter will monitor all your programs. And if anything crashes, it records it to the system log. And also records a crash dump for you. So very convenient. It uh, helps you fuzz. Uh, for some of the stuff, like WebKit, there's some source code available. So source code makes your life a little bit easier because you can compile it however you want with symbols, or you can instrument it to give you code coverage more information in your crash reports. Exploitation is, is you know, pretty darn easy on a Mac. So uh, they, they, they don't randomize anything, unlike most operating systems. So they, they don't randomize where the stack is, where the heap is, where they load libraries, where their, their, their binary image is loaded. On top of that, the heap's executable. So you store your shell code somewhere, jump to it, and, and you're in good shape. And you know everyone hates to upgrade or update their systems, and, and luckily Macs don't make you do it so much. So here, here's a chart, and it shows uh, some versions of some open source software that, that are on Macs, and then the, the corresponding version that that's on uh, available through open source. And uh, HD sort of stole my thunder a little bit on the on the final bullet in his talk, but until earlier this week when a patch went out, they hadn't upgraded Samba in like two and a half years, and there was at least a few pre-auth remote root exploits that you could have against Macs. And there were some actually in Metasploit that you could just you know, point and click. And as long as they had file sharing on, you could, you could own it. OK, so, so that's, that was uh, why uh, you know, Macs probably aren't the most secure platform. And uh, some of that will play into why we were able to actually get the exploit working on the iPhone, because the iPhone basically runs a stripped down version of Mac OS. Okay, so here's my formula for if you want to, you know, find a zero day on a Mac, this is what you do. So you find an open source package that they use that's out of date, and like I said in the previous slide, there's plenty of those. You read through the change log for that software, you find a bug that's in, that's been in a newer version, and, and you're done. So this is a way that you can find a bunch of zero days on Macs using like VI or more or grep or whatever your favorite tool is. So you don't have to worry about static analysis or fuzzing or any of that stuff, it's too hard, so you can just do it with a text, text editor. Um, so, so, so what are some examples? Well, WebKit 
uh, uses uh, uh, it, it uses part of this Perl regular expression PCRE library. It doesn't actually have the version number anywhere, but just by looking at it, it looks like it's around version 6.2. Uh, the current version is 7.2. And uh, if you look, a year ago there was a bug re reported, and it, it was fixed in version 6.7 of PCRE. It says, uh, a valid though odd pattern that looked like a POSIX character class, uh, but has an invalid character after the bracket, causes a internal error code overflow message, in some cases causes a crash with a glibc free error. Well, that sounds like it could possibly have security implications to me. Um, this is the actual JavaScript that, that if you would, if you uh, surf to a page with that JavaScript with Safari on, on any platform, uh, it'll crash. And it turns out that it, it's a heap overflow. Every time you put a couple of those little brackets, something, something, and another couple of brackets, you basically overwrite two bytes and a heat buffer. Because of the limitations on how big that regular expression can be, you're limited to writing 4,000 bytes past the end of the buffer, which is quite a bit. Uh, this, uh, since it's in WebKit, it's in all the applications that, that uh, use WebKit, including Safari, uh, Mail, and so forth. And it's vulnerable in Safari 2 and then their new 3 beta version for uh, Mac desktop servers, um, iPhone, and, and Windows as well. Is it exploitable? Yeah, this is actually the bug that we use to, to take over the iPhone. And I, sh I should say, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I didn't find this one by using the, the text file changelog technique. I actually found it with fuzzing. But this one I did find with the changelog technique. So uh, when you're a, a Mac researcher, it's another changelog entry, another Safari Zero Day. So here's one It says, it talks about uh, Subroutine references being quantified, and then it, again, it gives you the same sort of uh, error condition. So, if you get internal error code overflow, or there's a glibc double free corruption, I, you know that's probably pretty bad. And uh, again, this this was fixed in PCRE six seven, which came out last year, um, but uh, Apple never bothered to actually fix it in, in their source code. And here is uh, more JavaScript that if you go to that page in an unpatched browser or uh, iPhone or whatever, it'll crash. I should mention that these bugs were fixed earlier this week by Apple, I think on Tuesday. Um, the only thing you need to, to pay attention to is the iPhone, by default, when you sync it, it, it only checks once a week to, to upgrade itself or update itself. And uh, it's just sort of random, like what day of the week yours happens to check on. So, uh, you know, so you have like a three and seven chance if you haven't pressed the Force an update button yet to, to get upgraded, but so so please do that. Okay, so, so that's the vulnerability. Now I'm going to talk about how we actually got the exploit to work. So uh, the the problem with the iPhone from from our perspective was that there was no way to like get on this. It's not like a real computer where you can't like SSH in and, and do stuff. So you couldn't get on it. You couldn't run a debugger on the process to see what was going on. It was really sort of black box. The only thing you had going for you was Crash Reporter. So the iPhone had, just like a Mac OS, OS X, uh, you know, desktop or whatever, it has Crash Reporter, and it'll give you crash dumps and, and uh, logs, and, and it's sort of useful. So what we did, and we knew that these two bracket, bracket, star, star, bracket, bracket, if you throw one of those in, you're going to get two byte overflow. So what we did was we wrote a fuzzer, and its purpose wasn't to find a bug. It was to take control of the system. So we would randomly throw in a bunch of these little primitives that would overflow the buffer, and a lot of like long 